This will be a somewhat short lecture. The purpose, one, is to review what we did last time. And then the next thing, I want to show you some very simple type of electromagnetic structures, essentially reflection from a, a slab of material, a Bragg grating, an anti-reflection coating. And these are very simple structures that you can use to build into your grid that have analytical solutions that you can use to benchmark your code to make sure everything is working. So we'll review lecture eight, the basic FTTD algorithm, and then walk through the code for what we did last time for modeling transmission and reflection from a slab. Then I'll step you through some simple electromagnetic structures and I'll give you some simulation examples of two things. I won't go into a whole lot of detail there, but I'll explain the structures, I'll show you the simulation results, and you can use those to benchmark your code, simulate those, duplicate the results in these notes, and then you have a, a pretty good idea that your code is working correctly. So we talked about our grid strategy and we calculate some number of points. I'm showing a dozen or so here. Real grids will be 200 or more points. We will look over the whole the whole grid and find the maximum and minimum refractive indices. The maximum refractive index we use for calculating grid resolution. The minimum refractive index we use for the current stability condition. But we take those, the maximum that occurs anywhere in the grid. Then we add these boundaries and we need the refractive index at the cells where the boundaries are. They need to be the same for us to use this type of boundary condition but that, happ that happens at the very last cell. Then we go ahead and incorporate a total field scatter field interface and we have this dashed line. Everything to the right of this line will be a total field quantity containing the source and the reflected fields. Everything to the left, in this case just one cell, will contain only the reflected fields. So we're essentially launching a one wave source, one way source and anything that reflects off your device can get recorded here. So we're assured whatever fields we're recording in that first cell will only be a reflected quantity. So after the source is launched, we will record the fields at the first cell and the last cell in our grid. The first cell will be our reflection record point. The last one will be our transmission record point. And we will Fourier transform those at any frequency we're interested in and then plot transmission and reflection as a function of frequency. Then we build our device into the middle of the grid and we leave some space between the device and our boundaries, usually about a wavelength. And that's the longest wavelength that we will be modeling. And as I mentioned before, this actually is not necessary for our one dimensional model because our boundaries work so well. But I still like to put spacer regions here because we can visualize the fields leaving the device. And it also establishes some good practices when we move into two dimension and three dimensional models. We pull together this large block diagram of the complete finite difference time domain algorithm. We initialized our simulation, defined everything about what we want to model. We calculate our grid resolution, build the device on the grid, calculate our time step, calculate the source, initialize our Fourier transforms, calculate the update coefficients, set all of our fields to zero, initialize our boundary terms, and now we're ready to enter the main time loop. So our main time loop, we're iterating over time. So steps is going, or T is going from one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to steps. The first thing we do is update H from the curl of E. And this is a loop over the Z coordinate for one dimensions. So we loop over Z and update all of the H's based on the curl of E. Then when we're done this at one special point, we add this little correction term for the total field scatter field source. Now we've updated the H's, so we record the boundary H that we will use in the update for E. Then we move into our update for E. Again, this is a loop over the Z coordinate, so we loop over the entire grid and do this update equation. Then when we're done that, and we're done this loop, at one point after that, we incorporate this correction term for the total field scatter field source. Then we record the electric field at the boundary to be used in the H field update equation. Then wherever we're interested, all points and all frequencies, we update our Fourier transforms. 
Here I'm showing the, the DT parameter. We could choose not to put that here and calculate that when we're done this loop. And maybe we want to visualize things while this is running. This is our pseudocode for doing that. Again, we wrap everything in this time loop. Then we wrap our update of HX inside a loop over Z. We add our, our correction term for the total field scatter field. We record the H field of the boundary. Then we do a similar update by looping over Z and updating our E sub Y term. Then when we're done that, we incorporate our correction for the source, record our boundary terms. Then we loop over frequency and add up all of our Fourier transforms and then perhaps visualize our fields. When we're done, we're ready to post process. We've probably taken a bunch of Fourier transforms and so we take these Fourier transforms and divide by the Fourier transform of the source. Then if we're calculating reflectance and transmittance, we'll add those together and make sure we get 100%. And then we visualize our results. Maybe we show the field on top of the materials. Maybe we're plotting the transmittance and reflection. Maybe we're doing other kinds of post processing. We could do almost anything here. We outlined our FDTD into four big steps. One where we define the problem. So step one does not involve any MATLAB at all. We need to ask ourselves, what device are we modeling? What is its geometry dimensions? What material is it made of? What do we want to learn about the device? This is all information we need before we even sit down to do the modeling. Once we enter MATLAB, we initialize. We do the grid resolution, we build the materials on the grid, compute time steps, initialize the Fourier transform, compute source, all those types of things. Then we run the main FDTD algorithm, which update EH, EH, maybe there's Fourier transform in there, boundary conditions, all those things. Then we come out of that and we analyze and post-process the data. So this is the 60,000 foot level of what has to happen in finite difference time domain. Now last lecture we did this walkthrough. We wanted to model transmission and reflection from a slab of dielectric. It was in air and that dielectric had a permeability of two and a permittivity of six and it was a foot thick. And we wanted to calculate reflectance and transmittance from zero up to one gigahertz. The first thing we did was calculate the grid resolution. We considered the minimum wavelength and we considered the minimum feature size and ended up with a first guess of 0.43 centimeters for the grid resolution or the cell size. Then we adjusted that slightly because we realized our slab being a foot thick it would take 70.44 cells to represent that. So we would be off by about a half cell representing that one foot thickness. So instead we took our delta z parameter made it a little bit smaller and now we're at 0.4293 centimeters, and now that one foot is an exact integer number of grid cells so we can represent it much more accurately. Then we calculated our grid. We were gonna leave 71 cells for the device. We calculated that's how many cells wide it was on the previous slide. We wanna put a spacer region in of about 10 cells, so it's on either side, so that's a total of 20 cells. And then we add a few cells in there for where we do our sources and record points. Total of 94 cells is what we ended up with. We wanted to place our device in that grid. So we calculate a start and stop index. Our start index, we need to come past our reflection point, our total field scatter field point, then 10 more cells for the spacer region. We add one cell for good luck and we'll start on the 13th cell and we figure out how many cells wide our device is, it's 71. So we add 71 to 13 and subtract one and our stop index is 83. So if we fill in blocks 13 to 83 with the properties of that slab, then that's exactly 71 cells. So we initialize a big array UR and ER all to ones, which is free space, and then go ahead and fill in the permeability and permittivity in the slab region. Then we calculated our time step to do our perfect absorbing boundary. We calculated our source parameters. Given that we want to model up to one gigahertz, our tau is one over two times that one gigahertz. So we need a, the, the pulse duration needs to be about five times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. 
then we want to offset that. We don't want to start in the middle of the source, so we offset the position of that pulse about three nanoseconds, which is six tau's. Then we calculate the number of time steps, and it turned out we need a little over 4,000 time steps. Then we calculated our source. We let our electric field just be the Gaussian, and then our magnetic field had a scaled amplitude because of the material impedance, and also a delayed source, just a small delay, because we're a half cell apart and a half time step apart. Then finally, we initialized our Fourier transforms. We created our frequency axis, which had 100 points going from 0 to 1 gigahertz. Then we created a, another array containing another 100 points, which are our kernels, one for each frequency where we're interested. And then we initialized our reflectance, transmittance, and source Fourier transform arrays. We ran the simulation and came away with reflection and transmission and the source Fourier transforms. Then we div divide the reflection Fourier transform by the source Fourier transform and the same thing for the transmission Fourier transform and then what that is reflectance and transmittance. If we did not have any loss or gain then if we add reflectance and transmittance that's our conservation curve that should be 100 percent if everything is correct. Okay, so that was a review of last time. I went through it kind of quickly, skipped some details, but that was our, our basic walkthrough we did last time. Now I want to introduce you to some simple electromagnetic structures that you can use to build into your grids that you know what the answer is going to be. You can run your finite difference time domain simulation in a bunch of different configurations and hopefully figure out that everything's working correctly or troubleshoot what's going wrong. So in our one-dimensional finite difference time domain, all the waves have normal incidence. And if we go from material of one impedance to a second impedance, we know analytically what the reflection and transmission coefficients should be. So then we know what the reflectance and transmittance should be. And we can use that to benchmark our FDTD code. Well, suppose we're going from one material to another, where the impedance changes we know we're going to get reflections. How could we pre prevent reflections at one specific wavelength? Well, let's introduce an intermediate material. And so if we know the refractive indices on either side, which is normally the case, then we can calculate an average or anti-reflection refractive index, which is the geometric mean of the two refractive indices on either side. So the square root of their product. Once we know the refractive index of this intermediate material, we make the thickness a quarter wavelength. So it's the free space wavelength over the refractive index. That gives us wavelength inside the material. Then if we divide by four, that's a quarter wavelength. If we do that, we will have exactly zero reflection at this wavelength. And of course, going by refractive index, this assumes there's no magnetic response. If there is, if we have a permittivity and a permeability, then we have to design this in terms of the impedance. But usually the magnetic response is negligible and we can use this right set of equations for that. Our next device is a Bragg grating. If we have alternating layers of low, high refractive index, and we make the thickness of each layer a quarter wavelength, it turns out that will be highly reflective at that wavelength we used in our calculations. We can pick whatever the low and high refractive indices we want, and then we'll use the equations at the upper right to calculate their thicknesses. The more difference there is between those refractive indices, the wider the stop band. The more layers we include, the deeper the stop band. But the center wavelength will always be that lambda naught. So that's a Bragg rating. And this is a little bit more complicated thing we could build into our grid and see if our FDTD algorithm predicts that stop band. Okay, on to some examples. The invisible slab. So let's say we have a missile and there's a ray dome around an antenna at the front of the missile. So we're talking about somewhere up here. And it's either emitting or receiving 2.4 gigahertz. But this is a missile, it has to take a lot of shock. So that head of that missile is about a foot thick with a dielectric constant of 12. But we want to transmit through that. Something with such a high dielectric constant will reflect. 
we'd like to make it transparent to 2.4 gigahertz. So the question is, what do we do and then how do we simulate it with a one-dimensional finite difference time domain? Well, let's use the concept of these anti-reflection layers. We have this thick ray dome and we would just include two quarter wave layers on either side and each one will be designed to be an anti-reflection layer. So the dielectric constant, we take the dielectric constant of air times the dielectric constant of the material in the middle, take the square root of that, the geometric mean, and the dielectric constant of these anti-reflection layers needs to be about three and a half. That refractive index is 1.86. We need the refractive index to calculate the wavelength. The free space wavelength is about 12 and a half centimeters. That means the thickness, which needs to be a quarter wavelength of the wavelength inside the anti-reflection layers, is the free space wavelength over refractive index. That ratio is the wavelength inside the material. Divided by four makes it a quarter wavelength, and it's about 1.7 centimeters. So now we have all the dimensions that we need. If we throw this into our finite difference time domain engine, this is the, the correct answer that we should get. So I skipped over the details, grid resolution time step, and I'm leaving that up to you and use this as an exercise to duplicate those results. Our second example, the blinded missile. So let's say we have a missile and it's being jammed at a wavelength of 980 nanometers. And so that 980 nanometers is a high power beam on the ground that's coming into that missile and it's saturating the center here. So it's essentially being blinded. What we'd like to do is design some kind of window that blocks the 980 nanometer light. And we would like at least 30 dB of suppression. That means 99.9% .9 has to be reflected or absorbed. And the only materials we have to do this with is silicon dioxide with a refractive index of 1.5 and silicon nitride with a refractive index of 2.0. Those are our only options for materials. What can we do? Well, we can design a Bragg grading. If we know their refractive indices, then we can make them a quarter wavelength. And this Bragg grading, we can design to reflect at 980 nanometers. So here's the design. Given the refractive indices, the thickness, the wavelength is 980 nanometers, so the thickness of the first layer is 163 nanometers thick. The thickness of the second layer is 122 nanometers. So the next question is, how many layers do we need? This design will place the stop band at 980, but how many do we need? Well, just two layers, one silicon nitride, one silicon dioxide, will that be enough? How many do we need? And this is where we need to go to our simulation to try to answer that. We'll simulate it with a different number and see what happens. So if we try 10 periods, maybe this gets to be a little bit hard to see, but here's our device in the field over top. And what we see is that we, on the dB scale, we do get pretty broad reflection, but it only comes down to about 20 dB. Well, let's try 20 periods. Well, that goes all the way down to minus 45 dB or so. Well, we could go with that, but every layer we add is money and time, so can we get away with fewer? And it turns out at about 15 periods, we hit the 30 dB mark. So in practice, maybe we would want to use 20 periods or so. We'd want to give it a little bit of margin, but in principle, we only need 15 periods. That gives us 30 dB at 980 nanometers. So here's a close-up of the simulation. 